Great. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Delighted to be here to see so many known faces and uh, and, and looking forward to all of the discussion across uh, different fields. So I'm going to talk about uh, market design for the environment. And um, unlike uh, Mark, who did a very systematic um, uh, overview of every market design area for electricity, I may actually I will actually be a little bit more uh, selective. Uh, so I'm going to basically uh say you know first describe what are we talking about when we talk about market design for the environment second question i'm going to select uh a one specific uh application which is uh, cap and trade for carbon um and then i i'm going to talk about voluntary carbon markets because to, in today's world we cannot um uh, avoid them i mean they are happening and they are in need of uh good market design uh to Okay. So what are we talking about? I think it's important to realize that environmental markets are not only about climate change. I mean, climate change obviously is a big uh, thing, but uh, nature provides a lot of uh, services to us. I mean, it's about regulating services, you know, the, car the carbon cycle, the water cycle. It's about providing food. Uh, it's about uh, different supporting services like, you know, soil formation. That's all of these the things that nature uh, provides. They all uh, subject to large externalities, which is the reason why we may have an issue. Okay, and we may need to think about uh, correcting for these um, uh, for these uh, issues. I think it's useful, I mean, at least that's when I was trying to prepare this talk, how to organize my thoughts around. There are two types, um, two big sets of problems. One are common pool resources. So these are um you know goods and services that are non excludable but subject to congestion okay and then they are uh privately owned natural resources so they do provide service but they are in private hands okay and so the issue here is that some of the services they provide are positive externality and as a result the private owner may not have the right incentives to maintain them Okay. So the, the type of issues we have on the common pool resources, we are going to have two types of problems or sub problems. One is uh, when we talk about natural resources, we are interested in making sure that there's a an sustainable exploitation of them. So think about fisheries, water resources. We want to, you know, the, the typical incentive is to over exploit them, given that no one owns them. And we want to make sure that uh, we are, uh, um, you know, exploiting them in a sustainable manner. Then there are all of the, the other type of, of problems, sub problems here are pollution. So uh, we want to limit the pollution that impacts the quality of these com common pool resources. And here we can, there are many, many pollutants uh, and at different scales. So NOx, uh, sulfur dioxide, carbon, of course, for climate, uh, but other uh, toxic effluents also in water. So there's a long list of uh pollutants here and then on the the right hand side if i think about the privately owned uh, natural resources here the what we really care about is to make sure that the private owner um maintain uh these uh natural resources in terms of protecting biodiversity may actually be uh one of the services due to its its uh its uh, carbon sequestration or other uh ecosystemic uh services okay and so the, the primary concern for the, the market design, of course, there are going to be many concerns, but the primary concern is going to be different across these different problems. Here the, on, the first, uh, on the first one, the primary concern is making sure that the total cap, so the how many fish we can fish, is the right amount so that we don't cross the boundary where it, it becomes unsustainable. So that's, and, uh, so it's, that's the primary concern. If I think about pollution, here the, 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 the new aspect is the fact that different people may have different uh, access to different abatement opportunities with different costs. And so there, the primary concern as a result is going to be cost effectiveness. How we sure that we can, you know, of course, the cap is important, but just making sure that those who abate uh, are those with the, the lowest abatement costs is going to be important. And uh, of course, for the last one is also cost effectiveness is important. What's interesting is that in practice, in some some uh, in some places you have both private and public governance mechanisms, whereas of course for when we talk about pollution, typically it's the public. It's where these are regulated uh, markets. Okay, all of these uh, matter. So that's what we're talking about. And of course, what kind of markets we see then is going to depend 
on the nature uh, of these problems. Uh, if I think about uh, ensuring a, a sustainable exploitation, we can actually auction uh, drawing rights to those who value it the most, so we can allocate them through a lottery and then allow them to trade these drawing rights. Okay, that's one way. And you see this, you know, for water rights and, and for fish, for example. Uh, if I think about uh, cap and trade uh, for, for a mechanism to limit the pollution, uh, we can allocate or assign tradable allowances to allowances to uh, pollute, or we can say here's a baseline and again allow people uh, or, or, and credit basically people who pollute less than what they they were allowed uh, for. Okay, and and there's a list of markets uh, and the variety of markets is very uh, big the most in the, you're not the most interesting but the, the emerging types of markets on the right hand side here that there are really two types of issues one is pro, you know you can think of, of, about them as project finance so you want to make sure uh, to match those that seek uh, to compensate their pollution somewhere uh, with uh, those who are uh, uh capturing carbon or you would just want to uh, pay uh have uh, payments for ecosystem uh, services so all of the voluntary carbon markets are uh, on that on that side okay so that's the big picture about what you know the really big thing of what we're what we're talking about uh and i'm going to zoom in on uh carbon markets and and uh and most specifically on on the eu emission trading scheme because i have most experienced with that one, but you know, I'm going to touch upon the other uh, markets as well. Big picture on carbon markets, by the way, today, so in 2022, they were covering 17.5% 17, 17 of global greenhouse gases emissions. That's the coverage. And here's a picture. This comes from a report from the World Bank that gives you on the x-axis, you've got the fraction of the greenhouse, the domestic greenhouse gases that are covered by these markets. On the y-axis, you've got the average price per ton of carbon. Okay. And the, the size of the bubble is the tons, the, the size of the, 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 the greenhouse gases. And of, obviously, China is the biggest today okay so it's just big country big uh, large emissions uh and uh the you know one of those with the highest price is the uh, eu emission trading scheme it's actually the largest market still today in terms of value in and in terms of uh, uh but in terms of uh, size number of tons of carbon covered china by now uh, is the largest okay and you see some markets are really covering essentially if, if you think about korea almost all of the greenhouse the domestic greenhouse gas emission but with a very low price so that gives you a picture of the the diversity uh, of markets that are existing uh there okay this uh so now that we've set the stage it's just a range of uh, market design considerations you have to decide the market scope so which cover which sectors are you going to cover? Many uh, emission trading schemes are only covering electricity markets, but others are also covering, you know, uh, in energy intensive industries. How many get, are you going to cover CO two, but also the other uh, greenhouse gases? Um, are you covering all of the companies that are uh, emitting carbon, or only those above a certain threshold? Which jurisdictions? How many countries? Um, are you allowing people to trade across time? Can they borrow uh, allowances? Can they bank allowances? So these are uh, already a long list of, of uh, decisions. Then you have to decide on the cap. And of course, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are very directly linked with economic activity. So whenever there's an economic recession, the baseline level of emissions is going to go down. And if you don't want the price to go down, you might as well just think about how does the cap adjust to uh, business as usual uh, emissions. So there are uh, many jurisdictions have cost containment reserves or so market stability reserves in uh, in Europe. Um, there's a question of how do you allocate the allowances? Do you give them for free? Do you auction them? If you give them for th for free, how do you do this? Do you grandfather them or do you somehow uh, allocate them based on, on needs? Um, compliance, how frequently? Do you have penalties? Can they use offsets? Can they buy offsets in the voluntary carbon market and count them uh, uh, 
to cover, cover their own emissions. And then, you know, one thing it's, which I care most about because it's more closer to my research is how do you organize this market? Who can trade? It's actually not obvious. Some, some markets are limited to only the, comp the firms, the regulated firms, others not. Where? Centralized market, decentralized market, over the counter. What? Can you trade in two futures? Are there limits on trading and so on? Okay, so it's a long list of, 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 uh, of decisions. And of course, again, the primary objective is cost effectiveness, uh, sorry, yeah, cost efficiency. And so what, what this requires is to make sure that the price that's generated by this market is informative of the, the distribution of abatement opportunities and sufficiently stable. And why do I say sufficiently stable? Because a lot of these abatement technologies are bulky. So they are long-term investments, okay? That takes 20 years or 25 years. So in electricity markets, it's easy to uh, reduce emissions because you shift from coal to gas and then you've just you can do this very fast you know you reshuffle the portfolio and that you've reduced your emissions you are in steel or in cement you have to think about a different technology and re you know it's a it's a these are really long-term investments and then of course there's a bunch of other considerations because if cost efficiency was the only one it would be easy but people may cons be concerned about the geographical dispersion uh the the employment impacts uh uh, the implementation costs and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to give you a sense of all of these things mattering, and uh, you know, in, I, th I think the European uh, carbon market is a very nice uh, case study here because at the beginning they felt that market design was not that important, and they had to fix things. So it's back to Al's introduction. They see a problem and they fix. They try. They've tried to fix markets. They work in phases, so every phase is the same rules, and it's important, of course, to announce. The rules of the game so these are uh, and then they do this before the phase and then they see what happens and then fix uh things so a few things i want to uh, highlight of course the scope scope has been changing over time it's very uh usual that in many markets you know you start small you experiment and then you expand this has been happening more countries more gases more sectors okay that's easy how did they set the cap so there is more a political economy uh, lesson. Initially, they said that they would lay, let every country decide on their cap for the firms in their country. Okay. Now, if you think about the game that's being played here, in my Germany, I don't want to have too strict a cap. Okay. So that led to over allocations. In the meantime, now the cap is set at the European level, and there's a, a you know it's top down and it's just more systematic. Uh, they, they now they've increased the, the climate ambition of Europe, and as a result, the cap is actually going down much faster. Now, here for the lessons and the little uh, you know uh, crisis that you've got. So, um, the very first phase was a test, an experimental phase. So they 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 allowed they, they they gave allowances for free, but then said there's no bankability beyond the phase. So you know whatever is not used in phase one, you cannot use it later on. Okay. Uh, and later on now, today, you can borrow one, the equivalent of one year of allowances, but you can bank anytime uh, your, uh, your allowances. But as you remember, in 2007-8, we had a big economic crisis, you know, so um, uh, industrial activity went down and also uh, emissions. So that created a big economic, uh, a, a big market blood, too many allowances but if you look here nothing nothing is made for this right you could there were some excess allowances and they just stayed in the system and uh, as you can bet, uh, reduce the uh, um, the uh, the price this led to the adoption of what's called a uh, no market stability reserve and I'll come back to this later on initially the we you know we the issue was to make sure this uh, scheme was socially accepted or accepted by the industry. And so, you know, what you do is you grandfather the allowances. You give the allowances for free according to past uh, emissions. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, so starting in 2013, this, they started to auction uh, these allowances. And some sectors are subject to uh, competition from uh, outside of the EU are still given the allowances for free, but based on a uh a benchmarking uh 
uh, based on be benchmarking. So essentially we look at the 10% most efficient firms and we allocate everyone the allowances uh, that's, you know, that, that corresponds to the top 10%. So if you're less efficient than those, then you still have to cover some of your uh, emissions. Um, and last thing, in terms of even the infrastructure of these markets matter, initially everything was done at the national level. There was a, a few hacking events, there were some uh, a big VAT carousel that I think cost France about 5 billion euros at the time, so it was a big, uh, a really big deal. And so in the meantime, now everything's also centralized, centralized uh, registry and it's regulated uh, under MIFID, which is the financial markets directive. Uh, financial market uh, regulation in, in, in Europe. So before it was not even regulated as a financial market. Okay, so I'll give you a sense that your, the evolutions of, of, of these things. Uh, and so let me now talk about the prices because the, the prices is what really matters. Um, there are market fund fundamentals that drive prices. Uh, of course, uh, the abatement technology, how easy it is for me to reduce my emissions. It depends on the technologies, it depends on the sectors, of course. Um, the second driver, second fundamental driver is the business as, as, business as usual level of emissions that depend on the economic activity. It depends also, and importantly, on overlapping eco uh, 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 policies that impact the emissions of these sectors. And then finally, a third uh, uh, fundamental driver is the cap, how many allowances you let in the system, the timing of the allocation uh, for these allowances, and constraints on uh, banking and borrowing. Okay. If you play, if you use this, and you, you have a very simple way of modeling this market, okay, uh, the equilibrium prediction about the prices is that prices should be very stable. Why? Because in some ways there is going to be some arbitrage. So people are thinking, you know, you're arbitrary, like we are trying to sell each other these, the, the, these allowances to make sure that at every point of time it's the cheap, the guy who has the cheapest abatement cost that does it. But I'm also trading up and arbitraging across time. If I know that it's going to be cheaper in the future uh, to, um, to abate, I'm going to a bit not so much today and then you know do it uh, later okay and so it also means that if you have an economic shock to the system it's not in principle not going to have a big effect on prices because people are just going to smooth out the effect you're going to equalize marginal costs within time and across time up to uh, a, a discount factor and of course that's really essential if you want to drive long-term investment right if you want to make sure that cement and steel and all of these guys who have bulk investment invest, they want to, the, the, the more stable price you can produce, the easier it is for them to make the case to invest in these, uh, in these technologies. So what um, uh, is the EU ETS actually delivering these stable prices? So this is the, uh, uh, these are the uh, historical prices from the very beginning, okay? Uh, and today we are around 100 euros per ton, but uh, what you see here, so the first phase is the, the obvious one. You had some prices that collapsed to zero because remember there was too many allowances and you couldn't bank them. So price, you know, that's really like equilibrium behavior is, uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is happening. And then starting from phase uh, two, you, you see prices going down quite a bit. This is the economic glut following the global financial crisis where there was no adjustment mechanism to change the cap. So you just had all of these allowances, all being banked. Uh, prices at some point were around three euros. There were calls in the press of saying like, just doesn't work. At three euros a ton, there's no incentive to abate, right? There's just nothing. Um, and then recently, so this is the when the, the market stability reserve kicked in and there's a, a bunch of other stuff. And of course the cap is being strengthened, but prices are much higher. Uh, they are also um, quite variable and quite volatile. So this is actually, uh, if I focus on the uh, two, on the one year window, I think it's one year, it's just past year. Yes, just the past year window, prices have gone from 60 to 100 euros over the past year. So if you are uh, the CFO of a company trying to make the case for an investment, that this is just very volatile. I, I did, so I haven't repeated this. I did this um, 
before the financial crisis, uh, before the the uh, the energy crisis. But uh, uh, I had compared the price volatility of EU allowances with the price volatility of other commodities like gas and uh, you know oil and others where storage costs are pretty high okay whereas for uh, allowances there's no storage cost you can really easily bank them and so you you should expect much less volatility and that was the opposite so this is much more volatile than one would think so even though when i see this graph it looks you know economic you could explain the directionality of, of these prices yeah right you know the cap is being tighter so it makes sense it goes up and so on the le the level of volatility that we observe is just not uh compatible with equilibrium model okay and i think it's 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 a surprise and it's also a concern again for for driving investment so they have been luckily they have been some people you know people have been thinking about this i, th I think we there's still a lot of uh, questions that uh, and open uh, open questions but here are some of the conjectures that people have been uh, put forward so the first one is that these firms have much shorter time horizon than what we think okay they are um they have some risk management practices in place that requires them to hedge their positions in carbon on on a much shorter basis than arbitraging over time and so on and so forth so that's 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 one 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 explanation and it's very nice uh, paper i recommend by command and trottillon on, on this thing uh, i say cancel okay um and so i think that the, in terms of market design question that it it raises is, is like should we actually support long-term uh, markets for hedging so today you cannot hedge here the price of carbon beyond two or three years your investment in abatement technologies are 20 years 30 years we don't have markets to hedge uh, uh for this uh is that does that have an impact on the way we we adjust cap second uh conjecture is that uh They've been overlap. The overlapping uh, policies uh, have led to large shocks in uh, business as usual uh, emissions. So it's very famous that in in the U.S. the sulfur dioxide, the, the federal sulfur dioxide markets disappeared because essentially uh, stage level policies were strong enough that we didn't need the the the, the, the federal one. But uh, there's also a very nice paper uh, by Bornstein and others, uh, 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 and uh, in 2019. Um, so there, I think it, it begs the question of how should we adjust the cap for these overlapping policies. Um, a third explanation that been that hasn't been put forward in that context, but it's it's obvious from it's been a, uh, put forward in other contexts, is the fact that um, today people are using the emission trading scheme to hedge against inflation, to green their financial portfolios, and so the market is being used for other purposes than it was designed for okay and so there's this paper by Cheng and Zhang uh, who are suggesting that some of these commodities are facing excess volatility because people you know they are um, the victims somehow of uh, uh, the risk diversif diversification in financialized markets okay and I think and so then that that really uh, raises the question of who should be participating in some uh, in in, in uh, uh, you know in some jurisdiction everyone can participate even you and I in some others it's only only compliance firms okay um, it, these are very thin markets because typically people um, I have to comply comply only once a year and so that may also create excess volatility so that also the question that the, the design question here is should we lower the frequency of the market uh, people have been also suggesting that we should have staggered compliance markets just to make sure things are you know there's liquidity at, at, at all times um it's a highly fragmented market at least in, in europe but it used you know it's both decentralized there are there's centralized exchanges so it's very opaque um, and uh, you know, in some papers uh, with uh, with Aurélie, we we've shown that this actually increases. You know, it 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 um, it pre there's no pl uh, level playing field for participants. There are some participants who are less connected to the market who are just paying much higher prices uh, to uh, to buy these allowances, and that's also, uh, of course, uh, uh, creating excess volatility. So there, the question is: Should we 
centralized trading? Should we have market makers? Again, different jurisdictions have um, uh, taken different uh, uh, have, have taken different steps here. So that's on the volatility. I think there's um, some of the, the ways in which these markets have tried to address this price volatility is by putting price uh, stabilization, uh, stabilization mechanisms in place. And there are really two types of those. One is having price colors, like in California. So you've got a price floor, and then you have a, a, um, a top uh, price uh, ceiling. And of course, the problem here is that so now you have a hybrid market. So it's no longer a market like a quantity uh, market. It's it's uh, now you have a hybrid mechanism, and so you lose either the quantity target or the cost efficiency because if you have to ration price uh, quantities, uh, then you don't have the price anymore to to do uh, to ensure cost efficiency. Uh, the second type of of answers is is uh, having a dynamic cap adjustment. Um, that depends on the you know the quantity the balance between quantity uh, uh, supply and demand at any point of time. So in Europe, uh, they they started this market stability reserves in 2019, and it's it is it it is tricky in Europe. So I'm going to tell you exactly how they do this. What they do is that if the number of allowances in circulation is above a certain threshold, they are going to remove some. If they are below a certain uh, threshold, they are going to inject some, okay? Just to try and make sure there's a, enough liquidity. Now, the problem is if you are in a market where you know that the cap is going to go down, what you want to do is exert a lot of abatement effort before and bank. If you bank, there's going to be a lot of allowances on the market. And so you can imagine that the way this market stability reserve operates creates this feedback loop where people are banking because they are trying to anticipate the tighter cap going forward and then i'm going to remove some of the uh, allowances and so that's going to uh, spare it up okay and so i think that that's where you see again like you know careful design and understanding how people are playing this game is important um going to skip, skip this one emissions trading in a globalized world given uh the time because I, I want to talk about I think it's important to talk about voluntary markets I, it's not I'm not, not doing research on this but I spent a little bit of time looking at this in preparation of this talk if you haven't please check this uh episode uh by John Oliver I think it's excellent and it's an excellent introduction uh to this so what is uh what are voluntary markets essentially you've got projects that uh reduce carbon emissions relative to business as usual, or that remove uh, carbon. And on the other side, uh, you've got some individual or firm that uh, is eager to compensate for their, uh, their emissions. Okay? And so one is willing to pay for, uh, for the, the project, and the other one gives a certificate that shows that indeed uh, the emissions have been compensated. And of course, we want to be careful about which, what are these things, you know, we want to make sure that the project is indeed additional, that without the money, it would not have happened, that it's permanent, that the, 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 the emissions reductions are permanent. We need to make sure that we can figure out the right counterfactual, you know, it's a baseline accuracy, and that we can trace these things properly. And that's already really hard. And there's a bunch of intermediaries around this, you know, there are standards, there are third parties party certifiers, registries, market platforms, and various intermediaries. It's just like there's a lot of startups also on these things. So it's just a very uh, busy market. It's a busy uh, market. It's a growing. So in 2021, it was really, it just experienced really high growth. And it's, it's, uh, it's slowed down in 2022. And essentially, there's just a lot of scandals in this market. So there are issues about uh, greenwashing. So you see this on the left hand side press, but also researchers being active on this. So there's a group of researchers at, at the LSE uh, that have looked at whether carbon offsets are actually offsetting uh, carbon. And the answer is that at least 52% of approved carbon offsets were allocated to projects that would very likely have been built anyway. So there's no additionality. And moreover, they estimate that uh, the sale of these offsets uh, actually increase global uh, carbon dioxide emissions. A group of uh, researchers at Berkeley actually found that uh, uh, there's overcredit, a pervasive overcrediting from cook stoves offset methodologies. Okay, so that's 
gives you your sense that they are this is a market in need of market designers probably of, of, of need of, of fixing this is actually show, i'm going to skip this one but that shows that even one ton of carbon has a different price depending on the source so whether it's a removal whether it's nature based whether and so on uh, of these ones so you see that even this fragmentation at that level um there have been some recent development i mean so this is a market i think in, in crisis but there have been technological advances satellite Im uh, imagery blockchain I'll, I'll, i have one more slide after that one um uh, there's been um there's an industry-wide efforts to uh, revamp and harmonize standards and importantly the demand from the business side is going to be there so that's why we need to fix it it's really important to realize that that there's more and more efforts from the corporate side to go beyond value chain mitigation you know uh, uh, what, what's called uh, and and uh, and trust also address biodiversity the trust is important here and the the kind of market design questions i'd like to leave you with is just I think we need to understand we, we need to decide what's the primary objective of this market here is it project finance is it payment for ecosystem uh, services uh, beyond the, just the different accounting rules uh, should the design be the same one for everything for cook stoves and biodiversity for example uh, should the market be decentralized as it is right now it's not obvious to me okay so this you know that's that's my nice slide wide open area for research huge uh, potential social uh, societal impact for for research on environmental uh, market design i think these are both fundamental uh, research questions uh, and market design questions both at the macro level you know, like thinking about the cap you know these are macro levels but also in the micro level what kind of microstructures do we should we have more should we have market makers should we have should we allow everybody to trade and so on thank you very much sorry for